This is gonna be our last video for lecture three in our series here. And in this video, we're gonna introduce the notion of a piecewise function. So sometimes one single algebraic expression is insufficient to describe a function, maybe because the output needs, uh, it needs to be computed differently at different locations in the domain. I mean, think for example, like federal taxes and income brackets and such, right? Uh, it turns out that there's a lot of different factors to determine how much one would pay in U.S. income tax, uh, federal income tax and things like that. And so it, it depends on how much money you make, right? And so it changes, the formula changes based upon your income in a given year. This is an example of a piecewise function, where a piecewise function is a function that's broken into two or more pieces. Uh, when you're reading a piecewise function, like say f of x equals, you'll typically see first like this large brace. Uh, this curly brace that everything to the right of it will be part of the function and so you'll be given like then this everything to the right of the brace will be uh, into two columns right you'll have some type of formula uh so you'll have something like x squared plus x plus one uh, then you might have something like two times three to the x plus five and then you might have something like the square root of one minus x you know you have some functions provided to you this is in the first column so these are different formulas that will describe the same function f right here, but just at different parts. In the second column, we're then going to specify the domains of those pieces. So if we say something like when x is greater than 5, this is the domain for this piece right here when x is greater than 5. We might say something like, well, when x is between uh, 1 and less than or equal to 4, that determine you'll use this segment. And then we might say something like otherwise for everything else. That's a good way of doing it. Or maybe uh, we want to be more specific and we say something like, okay, uh, when X is less than or equal to one, we get the following, right? And so we then specify the domain here. And notice that things could be missing from the domain, right? I never actually told you what happens between four and five on this function. That's outside the domain. You can do that. With a piecewise function, you have to be explicit on what the domain is. Uh, implication doesn't work very well. In inference doesn't work very well unless you do have a statement that says otherwise at the bottom. Now, because of the nature of a piecewise function, you have all these, these very different function pieces put together. Uh, a term that comes into play here is the idea of a continuous function. We say that a function is continuous if it has no gaps or holes in its graph. Because what we will see very shortly is it's very easy for a piecewise function to have gaps and holes in it if we don't stitch it together very carefully. I like to think of piecewise functions as the Frankenstein of functions because we'll take the spleen of one function and stitch it to the intestines of another function, and we'll take the left pinky toe of another function. We stitch it all together and make this monster of a function. Let's look at a few examples of this. So our first one here, f of x here, is given as a piecewise function that has two pieces. The first piece will be x plus 1 exactly when x doesn't equal 1. So when x doesn't equal 1, uh, we, we define the function to be x plus 1. Uh, but then when x does equal 1, we define the function to be 3. And so we can see a, a picture of the graph over here of the function f. Now, if you're looking at the graph y equals x plus 1, this, is, this should look like just a linear function. Its slope is 1. It's y-intercept 1. It should look like what you see here in yellow. Perfectly fine. But for whatever reason, we've redefined what the function does at 1. When x equals 1, the y-coordinate is a 3. And you see that point right here. Uh, again, for whatever reason, x equals 1 was moved so that the y-coordinate was 3. On the other hand, if you actually plugged in x equals 1 into this expression here, uh, y equals 1 plus 1, you would kind of expect the function to be 2, right? When you look at here, there's like this hole um, on the screen there. You kind of expect the point 1 comma 2 to be a point on the graph, but for some reason, we redefined it to be something else. There could be a good reason for that. Um, but we don't have a verbal description to tell us what context would justify this. But for whatever reason, someone's removed the point. And as such, this function is discontinuous at x equals 1. So this function is discontinuous because it's not continuous. It's discontinuous at x equals 1 because there's a hole. There's a hole there at x equals 1. Uh, let's see. And then... That, that, that defines our, our function for us here, right? Um, I, should, I could say some other things. This, this graph, of course, is increasing. Um, it's increasing. 
making some connections to things we talked about before. It's increasing on the interval negative infinity to one, union one to infinity. Uh, the problem is at that discontinuity, we really can't say it increased or not because it kind of jumped around there. So we, we, we could say some things about this function. Its domain will be all real numbers because uh, it's defined for all real numbers, right? The domain of f is equal to all real numbers. There is no number that it's not defined at. It is defined at x equals one. Um, it's just something different than what the, what the picture might expect you to have. Let's look at another example. Like I said, these things are kind of freaks, Frankensteins of the math world here. Consider the function g of x, which is given by the following. Uh, g of x will look like the square root of x minus four when x is greater than or equal to four, and it'll behave like eight minus two x when x is less than four. And so we can see what's happening here. When x is greater than or equal to four, it'll look like the function, the square root of x minus four, which looks like this blue portion highlighted right now. Um, why that's what the graph looks like is something we'll talk about a little bit more, but basically it's the standard square root function that's been sh shifted to the right by four units. Uh, then when you're less than four, this graph will look like eight minus two x. This is a line which has a slope of negative two, one intercept of eight. Its x intercept will be four, and it looks like this portion right here. And so some things we can mention is that this graph is in fact continuous. It's continuous because there's no gaps or rips or breaks in the graph whatsoever. You notice that as it's switched from one part to another, it's connected. And that's what we mean by continuous. Continuous is to suggest that we could draw this picture with one continuous stroke of our pen without ever having to pick it up to draw the picture. That's what a continuous graph is. Um, its domain, of course, is going to be all real numbers. This thing is defined for all real numbers, no exceptions to that. It is, let's see, it's increasing on the interval uh, four to infinity, and it's decreasing. It's decreasing on the interval from negative infinity to four. Uh, we can say that the graph is concave upward, never, right? Um, it is concave downward on the interval four to infinity, right? And it's also straight on the interval negative infinity to four, because it's just a line in that context. And I want you to be aware of that a function evaluation here is like playing with a coin machine, a coin sorter. Like you put nickels and dimes, it'll automatically sort these things into different categories. If you want to do, for example, g of zero, well, zero is less than four, so use the second part right here. You're going to get eight minus two times zero, you get eight as the y-intercept, which if we continue on this trajectory, that's what you're going to get there. Um, if you want to do g of one, as another example, again, one is in the category less than four, so you're gonna get eight minus two times one, uh, which is equal to six this time. If you wanted to do G of say, uh, what's another one, eight, right? G of eight. Now this time G of eight is greater than or equal to four, so we're gonna use the other compartment. We're gonna get the square root of eight minus four, which is the square root of four, which is two. So the evaluation depends on which interval are you in when you're looking at this thing. All right, and let's do one more, one more example of these piecewise functions. This one's sort of an interesting creature. We have three different pieces here. When the function is, when x is less than one, we will look like the line x plus one. When we're between one and three inclusive, it'll look like the parabola x squared minus three x plus four. And then finally, when x is greater than three, it'll look like the line five minus x. At this moment, don't be too worried about how to graph these things. This will be things we will talk about in the future, although you might already be knowing how to do this. It's not like it's necessarily new information. But looking at the graph right here, right, what are some things we can say? Like if we take h of 0, uh, h of 0 would be in the compartment x less than 1. So we're going to take 0 plus 1 and we get 1. If you want to do, for example, h of 1, well, where does h of 1 fall? Uh, notice one is not less than one, one is equal to one. So you use the middle piece. You're gonna get one squared minus three times one plus four, uh, which is going to give you one minus three is negative two plus four, which equals two. The evaluation right there. What if you wanna do h of two? Well, h of two is again, two falls in this middle compartment. So you plug in two right there, two squared minus three times two plus four. Uh, we get four minus six plus four, which gives us two again. H of three, well, 
where is h of 3? So notice 1 and 3 are kind of significant for this function because these are the switching numbers. It switches behavior at 1, and it switches behavior at 3. Who decides what happens at 3? Well, that's because it's less than or equal to 3. It'll look like the parabola again. 3 squared minus 3 times 3 plus 4. You're going to end up with 9 minus 9 plus 4, which gives you 4 in that situation. And then lastly, if we did one more, like say h of 4, for example, 4 is greater than 3, so we use the line to determine what happens. We get 5 minus 4, which is equal to 1. We can do all those evaluations, and notice that when you take x equals 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, let's see, sorry, we're doing 4, I meant to do 1, 2, 3, 4, you get the point right here, uh, 4, comma 1. Uh, we ended up doing h of 3, we end up with this point right here, 3, comma 4. Uh, this point right here, where it's switched between uh, the line and the parabola, this would be 1, comma 2, we did that one, we did 2, comma 2 which is this point right here. We also end up doing the y-intercept, 0, 1, and we could do much, much more if we wanted to. Be aware that graphing a function is essentially just plotting a lot of points. It's about doing a whole lot of uh, evaluation and playing connect the dots. Believe it or not, that skill we learned in kindergarten is college-level mathematics. Uh, this is college algebra, after all. Uh, connecting the dots is how we essentially graph functions. We just get a lot of points and we connect the dots here. Uh, this function, of course, is not continuous. Uh, we do have this discontinuity right here. There's a discontinuity. It's discontinuous. I feel like there should be another letter in there. I don't know. I'm probably embarrassed myself. What you do here is whenever you don't know how to spell something, just abbreviate it. Uh, and then no one knows the wiser, right? It's discontinuous at the value x equals 2. Because you'll notice there's this break, this jump that happened in the graph. Uh, the function is at 3 is defined to be 4, but part of it wants to look like 2 right here, right? y equals 2. Um, that comes from this piece right here. If you plug in x equals 2 there, uh, sorry, x equals 3, you end up with 5 minus 3, which is 2. So the function is discontinuous. Um, it's increasing from in negative infinity to 1. It's then decreasing until this value, wherever that is. Then it'll start increasing again and it starts decreasing. We can do all those anal analyses for piecewise functions. It's just sometimes you need a more exotic function like this. And if you're careful, you can actually piece it together to make it continuous. Uh, but oftentimes, if you just throw random functions on the screen to make a piecewise function, it looks like this Frankenstein freak, uh, and it'll be a discontinuous mess. And so that brings us to the end of lecture three. Uh, we'll talk some more about functions, of course, in our next lecture. So take a look at the link that you should hopefully see on the screen right now. If you learned something, by all means, hit the like button. If you'd like to learn more about mathematics in the future, subscribe to get updates about future videos. And as always, if you have any questions whatsoever about the mathematics, um, if anything was unclear, if you just have want to get deeper, deeper into the material, ask your questions and post them in the comments below. I'd be happy to answer them. And until then, I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.